I'm Arlinda Cantu. I'm a pelvic floor exercise specialist. The pelvic floor is responsible for a great many things. It supports the pelvic organs, controls bladder and bowels. It also helps with urine and feces, our sexual function, breathing, and pregnancy and childbirth. It also helps with supporting our pelvis, our hips, and our lower back. So you can see the pelvic floor isn't a, isn't a static system. It's a dynamic system. So you must train it accordingly. Here we can see how the pelvic floor actually uh, holds up our organs. The pelvic floor muscles are connected to our, in front, to our sit bones, excuse me, to our pelvic bone, our sit bone on the sides, and our tailbone in the back. It acts as a sling to support all our internal organs as we move. From these slides, you can also see how many different muscles are connected to our pelvis. And so it connects to our pelvic floor. We have our front muscles of the legs. We have our inner thigh muscles. We have our hip muscles, our glute muscles. They all connect to our pelvic floor. So anytime we move, as in functional movement, we move the pelvic floor. And that's why Kegels alone don't quite make sense anymore. Here we can see as we look down into our, down through our abdomen, you can see the muscles that encompasses the pelvic floor. See how they're arranged from the, in the front to our pubic bone, in the back to our tailbone, and on each side, our sit bones, the bones we actually sit on. And here's that sling that I was talking about. So you can see everything is pretty much connected. Now, in this slide, you can see the diaphragm, our transverse abdominis, our pelvic floor, and then we have these muscles in the back that go from our tailbone all the way up. It doesn't show it here, but it goes all the way up to our base of our skull. These muscles are called our core muscles. Now, contrary to what people think, the six pack isn't our core muscles. So when as someone asks you to do a core exercise, don't point to your six pack. Tell them, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do. My pelvic floor, my transverse abdominis, my uh, diaphragm, and also those muscles in the back, those metiphitis muscles, they support the spine. So our posture, and I'm gonna go back just a little bit and I'm gonna review our breathing because I left that part out. Um, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor work together as a unit. So anytime we inhale, the diaphragm pushes down our internal organs. And at the same time, the pelvic floor pushes down to sustain those internal organs from them uh, popping out. So when we exhale, the diaphragm relaxes. And in return, the organs come back up and the pelvic floor comes back up. They work together as one unit. So. Think of it this way, we breathe almost 20,000 times a day. Now, that's 20,000 times we're working those units together, contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. Can you really imagine doing 20,000 bicep curls a day or better yet, 20,000 squats? No way. So that's why functional exercise, as in a squat, a lunge, 
work better when we're talking about exercising the pelvic floor. So now, since we have all those connections in our head, let's talk about our posture. Our mom always says, stand up straight. And there's really a good reason for it. When we stand up straight, our chest, as in i.e. our diaphragm, is stacked right on top of the pelvic floor, the pubic bone. So you can see how they can work very efficiently together when we breathe, each time we breathe. Now, the next one is the anterior pelvic tilt. And when we do that, you can see how our chest is rolling forward. And now it's not connected to our pelvic floor anymore. We're leaning forward, therefore the core can't engage properly. And if the core doesn't engage properly, that means we are not moving properly. Then we have our posterior pelvic tilt. The chest is behind the pelvic bone. And the same as an anterior pelvic tilt. We're gonna be leaning back. The front is no longer connected as in the core is no longer engaged. So when we start doing our functional exercises, we must always pay attention to our posture and our breathing. That's where we start. So now, since we have the background of everything the pelvic floor actually does. I know it's a lot, but it'll make sense the once you start doing the exercises and realizing why your trainer always tells you to breathe, breathe, breathe. Let's go, okay. Oh. So now, what type of exercises do we want to do to isolate the core? Simple exercises like lunges, low impact exercises like squats, riding a, a bike, spin class. But when you want to do spin class, you want to make sure you're not up off the saddle a lot. because That puts a lot of internal pressure on the pelvic floor. So you want to sit a lot when you're doing spin class or riding your bike. Um, uh, bridges, as you can see in the slide. Walking is a great exercise for working our core muscles. You just have to make sure that your posture is correct when you do it. And your stride isn't so uh, long. Stay in a comfortable stride. Shoulders back, make sure you're breathing fully from the belly all the way up. Let's not do chest breathing because that means we're not fully using that diaphragm. So when you take a group class, say an exercise group class, you wanna make sure when you're doing weights that you're not putting your arms straight over your head because that adds pressure to the body and then it adds pressure to the pelvic floor. Keep the waist down about shoulder height and make sure they're, they're in a resistance uh, weight that's proper for you. Don't try to do what your neighbor does. If you can do five pounds and your neighbor's doing 10, don't try doing 10 pounds. Um, side lunges, close in your side step so you're not standing so wide to put extra pressure on your pelvic floor. Same with front and back lunges. Close in your stride, make it comfortable for your stance. So how about those body pump classes? Everybody likes taking those classes to sweat and feel like they're getting a good workout. But at the same time, we have to pay attention to our core. So again, we don't wanna raise those arms up too high. We don't wanna keep those weights nice and low. We want to make sure we're breathing as we're lifting the weight, as we're exerting, we're always exhaling. Because remember, if we're exhaling, that diaphragm relaxes and the pelvic floor engages, everything comes up. If we're holding our breath or inhaling, we're pushing everything down and we're putting extra stress on that pelvic floor. 
So that is the type of exercises you want to do when we're actually working those core muscles. Exercises like the plank. There's a thing out there, the longer you can do a plank, the better. But we have to remember our core muscles are stabilizing muscles. They can't hold for a long length of time. They will fatigue. So for those plank muscles, those specific core muscles, try not to do those over, hold them over 10, 15 seconds. That's really good for the core because it will actually engage fully and not slowly disengage. So that said, we as humans are made to move. What we do in our lifestyle these days, we sit too much. We get up in the morning, we go down, have breakfast, and we sit. We get dressed, go to work, as we're driving to work, we're sitting. When we get to work, what do we do? We sit at our desk, go to lunch, sit, go back to the office, drive home, we're sitting, and we get home, and what do we do? Fix dinner, and we sit. And we're saying, oh my gosh, I really need to sit and relax. Well, guess what? The number one activity that shuts off the pelvic floor is sitting. So that's why Asian countries, African countries have less incidence of pelvic floor uh, dysfunction because they're constantly walking and they squat a lot. And squat is one of the main exercises for engaging that pelvic floor because it works the glutes. And remember, the glutes is part of our core muscles. Uh, European countries, they walk everywhere. And that's why they have less incidence of pelvic floor dysfunction. So if you take anything away from this lecture, you know we have to move. If you're working at a sitting desk, try standing. or if you can't stand a lot, try getting an exercise ball. Sit on it and rotate the hips. That's working the core as you're sitting on that ball because you have to stabilize. So I hope you got a lot of useful information out of this uh, small lecture. But if you want any more and go more in depth, we have a class here at St. Jude's Rehab on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. And we go over the exercises more in depth and we go over different types of uh, functions, dysfunctions, uh, anatomy of the pelvic floor and how the muscles actually work as they're doing the exercises. It's a fun class. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And also this coming Saturday, um, February 26th at nine, from nine to 10.30, we're also having a pelvic floor workshop when we'll go over lectures, anatomy, and physiology of the pelvic floor. And we'll do some of the few exercises that I mentioned. So, um, so I'm gonna pass it over to our dietitian, Taylor, and she's gonna take over from here. All right, thank you, Arlinda, for your information on Pilates and your pelvic wellness. My name is Taylor Rickroad. I am a registered dietitian here at St. Jude Wellness Center. and Interestingly enough, there's a lot of um, nutrition interventions that you can do to improve your overall pelvic health. So let's take a look at a few of those um, ideas. So typically when I see patients who are suffering from pelvic floor dysfunction, there's a lot of similarities. And probably the most common one that I see is either constipation or alternating diarrhea. And so typically we really wanna work on gut health first. And there's a lot of foods that you can eat to really support your gut health. So some of the most important foods that you can eat include cruciferous vegetables, foods with fiber that help to um, create healthy bowels and to prevent constipation, 
And it is recommended that everyone consume at least 25 to 35 grams of fiber every day. If that's something like you feel that you might not be getting enough of, we can work one-on-one -on -one to determine how much you might be getting in your day. The other thing we can work on together is making sure you are hydrated properly. And there's a lot of research on your pelvic health and hydration associated with inflammation. And so typically what I recommend is if every single morning you can start your day with lemon water, Lemon is a really powerful food because it contains a lot of antioxidants to help to buffer inflammation. It helps to improve hydration and it also helps to decrease on um, constant urination. Typically alcohol and a lot of caffeinated beverages are associated with some bladder irritation. So those might be some beverages that you either cut down or avoid. The other foods that we want to focus on involve um, omega-3 fats. Now, omega-3s are incredibly anti-inflammatory. They help to restore balance to the body. And having tissues that are, that are not inflamed are a really important part of maintaining your pelvic health. So, you know, there's a lot of different foods with omega-3. For example, wild caught salmon is a great source of omega-3. Uh, ground flax seeds are a really good source. Um, if you don't eat either of those foods, you know, you can incorporate a fish oil supplement into your daily diet. Next, pelvic floor health is really impacted overall by the strength and the integrity of all of the tissues and the muscles within your body. If you're not getting enough protein, if you're protein malnourished, then that could impact the strength of your pelvic muscles. And so making sure you meet your protein requirements is something that we can do together. So, um, you know, whether it's from meat, eggs, uh, quinoa and soy are actually great sources of all of the amino acids. Uh, these foods can really help with um, making sure your protein needs are met. Next, let's take a look at some of the foods that, you know, you might want to avoid to um, decrease the aggravation of your pelvic floor muscles. There's actually a good amount of research on artificial sweeteners and how it could change your gut microbiome. So even though artificial sweeteners are not providing sugar and nutrients, they are providing substances that create chemical messengers in the body. And like I said, there is some research that shows it can uh, affect the good bacteria in your digestive system. Um, I mentioned caffeine before. There is a good amount of research showing that um, over-caffeinating can really irritate your bladder and thus cause stress on your pelvic floor. And then um, an antidote to that is actually to um, drink teas. And, um, you know, there's a lot of herbs and spices within uh, tea mixes. Spices have been shown to really help with uh, decreasing inflammation. And then if we meet together, you know, determining if you're getting enough vitamins and minerals from your food is something else that we can do together. Lastly, you know, I mentioned constipation, which can be a, a major factor in pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, typically, processed foods are very poor in fiber. So even if you eat, you know, some, cutting back a little bit can help overall with constipation. If you have any questions or you'd like to reach us for an appointment, you can call us at 714-578-8770. And once again, my name is Taylor Rickroad, and I am the registered dietitian here at St. Jude Wellness.